Thank you, Senator, and, and, and thank you for accommodating my <clears throat> schedule. I was tied up in another room earlier today. It's been a long while in Rub Center, Chaplain. For me as well, but uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm speaking today in favor of LD uh, 725, um, and I'll be very brief. Uh, you know that uh, the state constitution has a home rule in it, and you also know that uh, the state policy is was defined in in favor of uh, local controls uh, on agricultural matters. Uh, what you may not know is that the what's called the local foods movement or the food sovereignty movement actually started in my district, and I'm proud of that. It was not. I'm sorry to say I was not responsible for it. I wish uh, I, uh, I've been supportive of it, but uh, it's actually the the activists in my area that were responsible for it, and so. What started is um, first with one town, and then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth town in my district uh, is now 18 towns statewide. I just wanted to let you know very quickly that um, I attended the town meetings in the towns of Sedgwick and Penobscot when they, when both of them had unanimous votes in favor of, of, of that uh, local control of food systems in, in my district, and I attended the town meeting in the town of Blue Hill in which the vote was about 120 to 2 in favor of it. I just wanted to let you know that uh, that, that is the, the reason why that movement has spread uh, around the state. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I just wanted to get on the record uh, showing my support. Thank you. We are on the record. Any, any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there any wishing to any further wishing to speak in opposition? Only in opposition. Is there anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against this legislation? Anyone for nor against? Seeing none? Oh. Right up, sir. Good afternoon, Senator Davis, Representative Martin, and other distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on State and Local Government. My name is Craig Hickman. I represent District 81, Winthrop Breedfield, and a part of North Monmouth at the foot of Mount Pisgah. Today I stand before you in the position of speaking as a foreign or against the bill, even though I'm a co-sponsor, because this is usually the part um, of the hearing where clarity and information can be provided to the committee to help you with your deliberations. And so um, I um, am going to attempt to answer some of the questions that have been asked. This bill, I presented a version of this bill as a concept draft in the first regular session of the 126th legislature four years ago. I ran for office precisely because I am a farmer in a small town and was a little perplexed by the notion that I had moved to a libertarian state but could not post a sign on the side of my road telling my neighbors that I had certain things available for sale unless or until I had become inspected by different departments to make that happen. And so I didn't know there was a food sovereignty movement in Maine until I put the bill in. And since then, um, there were nine towns that had adopted the ordinance. And since then, there have been nine more. The 18 towns that have adopted in the order of adoption are Sedgwick, Blue Hill, Penobscot, Brooksville, Trenton, Brooklyn, Alahote, Hope, Plymouth, Livermore, Appleton, Alexander, Freedom, Liberty, Moscow, Bingham, Salon, and Madison. And as you heard earlier, the city of Rockland passed a supportive re resolution urging the state to do this. I also, if the committee clerk would indulge, I have a model of the local food and community self-governance ordinance that was requested by the committee earlier to share. It has 12 sections. It refers to state law. It refers to the Constitution. It is a rights-based ordinance, which is actually described in one of the sidebars at the very end of it. But I want to say that Section 5.1 describes license, licensure and inspection <coughs> exemption. And here's where the rubber meets the road, because this actually is a regulation. Producers or processors of local foods in the town of, insert your town, are exempt from licensure and inspection provided that the transaction is only between the producer or processor and a patron when the food is sold for home consumption. And the reason why that's important is because the testimony earlier from industry saying that this might mess up or interfere somehow with the commodity markets around milk or potatoes, 
It has nothing to do with anything sold as a commodity in the state of Maine and regulated currently as a commodity by the agencies that regulate those commodities um, for commerce. This is really about face-to-face, -face, me to you, but only for your home consumption and not for any other resale or retail. And I think that is where this bill <coughs> gives municipalities the authority to say that in their borders they will accept that that is regulation enough. And I'm happy to hear that the Maine Municipal Association supports this bill, at least as it refers to food, for that very reason. Rural economic development is absolutely enhanced when a small food producer can legally sell his or her food to his or her neighbor without state licensing or inspection. It is up to the person who is receiving that food to understand with informed consent what they are getting. Which is why section 6.2 of the ordinance says patrons purchasing food for home consumption may enter into private agreements with those producers or processors of local foods to waive any liability for the consumption of that food. I think all of us have gone to a community supper in the state, a bean supper, a spaghetti supper, a nonprofit organization may host a fundraiser for a family that's, ail that's ailing. Much of that food is not produced in a licensed kitchen and current state law doesn't require it because of an exemption for a nonprofit purpose. Most of the small farms that are in, engaged in face-to-face in -face transactions with their consumers, like I am with farm stands on the side of the road, are not going to register as nonprofit organizations, but the same theory applies to that transaction. People know my food, and they're happy to buy it. I wanted to answer Representative Martin's question about what happened in the 127th legislature. It was not necessarily a similar bill, although it invoked a similar right. LD783, which I introduced last session, was to establish a constitutional amendment to establish a right to food. And I won't read that, but we were voting to send that resolution to the people that would state very clearly that individuals have a right that is natural, inherent, and inalienable to acquire, produce, process, prepare, preserve, and consume the food of their own choosing for their own nourishment and sustenance. And it goes on to say how that can happen. So I appreciate the committee looking at both of these issues together, the food and water. I understand the concerns that have been raised about water. And I don't want any of those concerns to sort of tank what really is a good idea to move Maine forward around the food side. The Supreme Court in the state versus Brown, which was referred to by a person earlier, did not render any of these ordinances unconstitutional. In the ruling, it made it very clear that if the state recognizes the ordinances, then those ordinances will have teeth at the local level. And it absolutely, therefore, does remove state preemption around those particular transactions in those communities that have decided that this is what they want for the people in their communities. So this is one layer where an individual right is protected by a town, and that individual right, therefore, is supported in that community. And so the town is representing the individuals in this case, instead of the individuals having ground to stand on on their own, which would be the perfect way to put it in the Constitution. But one of the oppositions that we faced last <laughs> session was the legislature can handle this. We don't have to amend the Constitution. This is one of the ways that the legislature can handle this without amending the Constitution. So with that, I'll stop. And I'm here, I'll be here for the work session. But if anyone has any questions now about the, the information that I provided, please let me know. And I'll any questions? Senator Kine? Welcome. Thank you. Um, maybe this is a question that you mentioned you'd be here for the work session and you're here to clarify, <coughs> you know, your stance was to clarify something. And listening to the testimony today, we heard from several stakeholders in the dairy industry, which I'm very familiar with. Um, but one thing that I don't understand is how local uh, local ordinances are going to affect <coughs> the regulations that are already imposed on the dairy industry because they're gonna, their, their resale is a completely different outlook than what we're discussing here. So I think that's information that we need um, for the work session, okay. if you wouldn't mind. Not a problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Others? Does the BB sell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Would you mind um, putting into writing that relationship of home rule 
representing individuals in town and regulations um, for the state? I, 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 certainly, I certainly can do that. I will say um, gently that the definitions in the local food and community self-governance ordinance that you have in front of you, <coughs> when you get to the preamble and purpose and section four authority, it basically outlines which parts of the statute and which parts of the Constitution this ordinance is invoking. In some ways, this ordinance talks to state law, mm -hmm. and state law talks back to it. And that was actually done intentionally. So for instance, if you are on uh, page 19, is what it says at the bottom, 201A, which is invoked in the statute in front of you, but you'd have to actually read it from Title 7A says, it is the policy of the state to encourage food self-sufficiency for its citizens. The Department of Agricultural Conservation and Forestry shall support policies that, one, through local control, preserve the abilities of communities to produce, process, sell, purchase, and consume locally produced foods. Three, I'll skip to improved health and well-being, improve the health and well-being of citizens of this state by reducing hunger and increasing food security through improved access to wholesome, nutritious foods by supporting family farms and encouraging sustainable farming and fishing. And it goes on to talk about self-reliance and economic, rural economic development. I, will, I can put this in writing more clearly so that you see all of it, but this really helps you get to that point because this is referring to state law that we passed in 2013. And that was after the first nine towns had passed ordinances. So what we were trying to do is strengthen what's in state law, strengthen the ordinance by reflecting what is in state law. Because what we put in state law actually came after the Supreme Court made their decision in the state versus Brown. And this was a part of reading that decision and trying to make clear in state law what it was we were doing. We are not preempting all regulation. We're not trying to get rid of any regulations except for in towns that have passed this ordinance, face-to-face -face transactions direct between producer and consumer are the only ones that we are saying are exempt from licensing. And I should say that at the federal level, we have all kinds of guidelines for regulating the processing of meat, which we haven't heard a lot about today. I was just in a town above Bangor where a gentleman who is running a file of law is a custom meat cutter. And he's a custom meat cutter without a license. And he said, you can't tell anyone this. And I said, well, I'm not really a law enforcement officer, but I'll just close my ears as you explain to me what you're doing. He processes wildlife that has been uh, foraged by hunting. And he also processes what the federal government would call an amenable species, which are pigs and goats and lamb and cows um, for human consumption. And he does all of this in a shed behind his house, which is actually very well maintained. It's very sanitary. He says he's never been inspected, but he cannot keep people away because the people in his community use him all the time. And he told me that if he were to be inspected, he knows that he would not be able to do what he's doing, which is prepare bear and moose and deer for his neighbors, as well as pigs and chickens and cow. And so, and I said, you're right about that. There are state laws that prohibit that. There are federal laws that prohibit that. And he says, but I need this for my retirement. And so I hope I never get caught because I don't want anyone to put me out of business. And so if he lived in a town where this ordinance were enacted, he could at least say that this gave him some protection against a state authority. If you pass this bill, it would give him the ultimate protection against state authority because he's only processing that food for his family, his friends, and his neighbors. And they are not reselling that food anywhere else. And that is the point of what is in front of you, is to make that transaction legal so that people can come above ground and stop operating in the dark, looking over their shoulders, thinking that someone is going to come and shut them down. And if I had more time, I would get into how the FDA doesn't really protect us at all, but I really won't go there. <laughs> Come to the work session. <laughs> Anyone else? Representative Madigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for providing this, Representative Hickman. Uh, obviously, you've been involved in this a long time. Why? Yes, uh, sir. I, I still don't understand why uh, this was submitted with the whole new water thing in when this ordinance has nothing to do with the water. I mean, we've had a lot of testimony now that right. several people think it's aimed at Poland Springs. So 
I think that I understand that criticism. I understand the comment. I think that it becomes clear to us who do work the land that we are facing a future of uncertainty when it comes to whether or not clean water will be available to us in order to have to raise our food. You need clean water for good soil. I happen to be an organic farmer, and so I don't use any chemicals of any kind. Water is extremely important to that process. And so that's probably why water was put into this bill. I mean, I know that's why water was put into this bill, so we could have the conversation about if we can regulate local food systems, but we are not talking about our water systems, then we're really missing part of the, the, the crux of the matter. That being said, I'm not opposed to the committee working on this in such a way that we can preserve what at least the main municipal association sees is necessary for clarity and maybe deal with the other issue in some other way, if that helps. Anyone else? Representative Sale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one, one quick question. Uh, going to what you call the Rum Hitch Road, is mm -hmm. by that one producer's uh, are exempt from licensors and inspections. Does that mean they would be exempt from a municipal inspection if a municipal inspection was contained in the ordinance? If this were the ordinance that passed, I suppose that would be true. But if a municipality said, we want the ability to inspect you, I suppose they wouldn't put that part of the ordinance in effect because we're still allowing for home rule to decide what that's about. This is really exempt from state licensing well, and state inspection. That's what I assume, but I yes. just wanted to... And so if it needed to be more clear at the local level, it would be up to whoever put that ordinance forward or in the warrant to make sure that that's clear, that it's not the state that would be doing the inspections. There are some communities that use local food councils, if you will, to sort of help make sure that places that are providing food direct to consumers are following certain state laws. I should also say we want the state to inspect as much as we can in some regard. Some of us don't think we need it, but there's not enough inspectors anyway to inspect all of the different food outlets that exist in the state of Maine. That's just the fact. We don't appropriate the funds for it, and the inspectors have to choose very carefully where they're going to spend their resources. In some sense, this becomes a relief to the state because the state is therefore not required to look at the, the the outlets, the producers that are simply selling direct to consumers, either on their farms or through delivery techniques or through um, uh, group shares and herd shares that are under private contract. And so I just believe that the clarity that is provided in this legislation is necessary moving forward because there will be more towns that do this and the courts will have very clear guidance if anyone ever takes this up in front of it what the intent was. And we are using the court's ruling in a case where this was on um, trial to give them clarity if they were ever to adjudicate this in the future. Others? Anyone? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Ma'am, would you like to speak? Okay, you come right up. Thank you very much for, for hearing me, and I'll try to be really quick. Um, my name is Heather Whittier. I grew up in the Midcoast, but I now live in Augusta, very close to the Kennebec, where my grandmother's side of the family have lived for millennia. And, and I'm the, the first one to, she was the first one to leave the Kennebec, and I'm the first one to come back. And, uh, I, thank you. It's, uh, so I, I came here to stand in support of LD725. But I was going to stand silently in support. I've, I've been a, a big supporter of local food ordinances for a long time. I, I raised five children in this state on a low budget, and I've had a lot of contact with farmers around. You know, I've, I've, I, I really support the, the local food ordinance movement. What got me to, to come up here and speak was listening to the, the lobbying from all the representatives of Poland Spring talking about the dollar values and the dollar values. And I understand, being a legislator, that a lot of times it does seem to come down to just the dollar values because you need to come up with it from somewhere. And I understand that pressure. But it just reminded me so much of what the, the CEO of Nestle, who owned, you know, which obviously owns Poland Springs, said about water which is that unless you put a monetary value on water, how will anyone know that it's valuable? And my, my thought when they, I heard him say that was, well, if you go without it for a day, you'll start to realize that it's valuable. 
And so I just wanted to get up here and say, I understand the economic pressures. I understand really deeply, but it's important to link these two issues because you cannot have food without water. And really, water is part of the public trust and, and you know, you are our guardians of the public trust. And to be able to make local decisions based on local intimate knowledge, you know, as I said, I grew up in the Midcoast. It's different here in Augusta. You know, local municipalities work because people understand how their areas are different. And water is life. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak, neither for nor against? Good afternoon, uh, Senator Davis, Representative Martin, members of the committee. My name is Roberta Manter and I'm from Fayette, Maine. Uh, when I heard that this bill was on for today when I was here already, I thought this is something I want to listen in on because my daughter is, I guess you would call a, a very small farmer. She has a huge vegetable garden and she often has surplus vegetables and not enough money. And it would be uh, very good for her if she could just sell her leftovers to her neighbors without having to worry about whether she's licensed or inspected or any of that sort of thing. Uh, there often are quiet transactions that take place where, hey, I've got some extra. Hey, can I give you a tip? Uh, and it's, it's nothing official. It's not a so much per pound or anything of that sort, but it's a, a very, very uh, beneficial tra transaction on both sides. I want to thank Representative Hickman for providing a lot of clarity. I very much appreciate his sentiment of speaking last so that he can answer questions. I've done that myself on occasion. Uh, and I think that if the uh, ordinances that are in place already had been put forward at the beginning so that all these people here could have seen what they were talking about, I think a lot of the testimony today wouldn't have been here. I, I'm rather concerned about you know, all the, the uh, big business interests that were here. I think you have to remember that part of your job here as legislators is to protect the little guy. And when, when the big businesses come in with a lot of money and uh, they can say, oh, look what we're doing for the tax rolls for employment, it's very easy to hear that and forget that the little guy needs to be protected because the little guy doesn't have a big voice to speak against those interests. And uh, I'd just like to remind you that that's part of your job here. Uh, one other point that I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, there was mention of what you do in a, a small meat cutting operation. Years ago, I took a, a course on meat cutting when I was at University of New Hampshire. And I don't know how the law is here in Maine, but we were told in New Hampshire that the way that they could do it for the meat cutting course was they sold the live animal to the person in advance and then the person was allowed to have them cut the meat. If they had cut the meat and then sold it, that would have been illegal in New Hampshire. So I don't know whether that is a consideration in Maine or not. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Is there anyone else wishing to speak neither for nor against? Seeing none, we will close the hearing. And uh, we're not sure when we, it hasn't been advertised yet, the work session, but it'll be within a couple of weeks or so. Uh, Reverend Martin, did you have something? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've got a couple of housekeeping matters for those folks in the audience. Uh, we just spent a little over three hours on one particular piece of legislation. We still have five others, as you well know, Mr. Chair. Uh, four others, thank you. Uh, LD 740 uh, will be taking up. Uh, will be taking up at the last piece of legislation this afternoon. Be uh, doing uh, 1192, and it's my understanding that we'll be caught. Be uh, doing uh, 1192, and it's my understanding that we'll be caught.